Thank you, Jeff. Uh, we've reached another moment in the program where it's time to look at some art. So I hope you enjoy this. I'm delighted and honored to be with you all today to celebrate the International Year of Glass. And I plan to cover more than 35 centuries of creativity, innovation, and art in glass from the ancient Mediterranean world to the 21st century in 20 minutes or less, so I'll be speaking very quickly. <laughs> uh, and in doing so, I'm gonna be hopping across time and place, calling out moments of innovation and technical advancement that had an impact on the artistry of glass. And all of the images I'm going to be sharing with you today come from works in our collection at the Corning Museum of Glass. So please sit back and enjoy this ride through three millennia. The archaeological record tells us that the process of making glass was developed during the Bronze Age, sometime before 2000 BCE, in Mesopotamia. The remains of this earliest glass are a few small fragments, mostly from beads. The how and the why of glass making are not known, but because beads and other objects made at that time were decorated with vitreous glazes, it may have been a happy accident that then changed the world. While the origins of glassmaking began in Mesopotamia, the technology te blah, 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 speaking too quickly. Okay, the technology quickly spread first to Egypt and then elsewhere throughout the Mediterranean. By the 1300s BCE, glass ingots were being transported as a commodity to be reheated and formed. Thus, the manufacture of raw glass and the making of glass objects were already distinct processes by the Late Bronze Age. And like the ingots, the minerals that were added to the glass batch to create the specific colors, such as cobalt for blue and copper for red, were mined in one location and transported around the Mediterranean world. The quantities of glass produced at this time were small, imagine a crucible, and glass was considered a luxury material. The colors developed for the earliest glass objects were opaque and intentionally resembled precious natural materials like turquoise, lapis, carnelian, and other colored stones. One of the earliest ways it was shaped was by casting, melting powdered glass or chunks of glass in molds to form pendants and inlays like this portrait of the Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten. Another early technique is called core forming in which a core made of a material like clay or mud is wrapped around a metal rod. Hot glass was applied over the core, most likely by trailing thick ribbons of glass and then marvering it to consolidate the material. Additional trails could be added to create decorative stripes, which were then dragged to create zigzag or feathered designs. Once cooled, the core was removed from the glass to reveal an interior cavity. Flame working was another of the earliest methods of shaping glass, and quantities of beads and pendants were made, worn, and traded across vast distances, even from the Mediterranean world to Asia along the Silk Road. Among the most complicated of bead designs are the eye beads made in China in the Warring States period. The design of Chinese eye beads was inspired by those made in the Mediterranean, which were worn to ward off evil. But in China at this time, the eyes have been stylized into a much more decorative form. The mosaic technique of combining small pieces of glass to create a decorative effect is one of the earliest glass making processes known. This bowl was manufactured by per first placing segments of patterned glass rods into a design and fusing them into a disc shape. The edge was finished by adding a segment of cane with a spiral pattern. The disc was then sagged over a hemispherical mold to form the final shape. The use of glass was not limited to vessels and jewelry, but was also used in architectural decoration, including windows, walls, and floors. The mosaic technique was used to create this revetment of a fish that was once inlaid into a plaster wall. It was created at the time that Egypt was nearing the end of the Ptolemaic dynasty and coming more and more under the influence of the Roman Empire. One of the greatest technical achievements of early Roman glass makers was the creation of cameo glass. Cameo glass was designed to imitate precious layered stones like agate and carved in such a manner to showcase the contrasting colors. The development of cameo glass coincides with the onset of the groundbreaking technique of inflating glass on the end of a blowpipe in the second half of the first century BCE, 
and surviving examples of cameo glass were either blown or cast. The creation of the multi-layered blank took great skill and involved combining opaque and transparent glass that had a similar coefficient of expansion. This assured successful annealing. Once annealed, the blank was handed off to a craftsman skilled in cutting techniques to carefully carve away the outer layers of glass and complete the design. There was a high level of lead used in the white glass, which made it softer and easier to carve. The development of glass blowing caused a seismic shift in how glass was made and used. Processes evolved from being laborious and multi-stepped to a swift choreography of skill and creativity. Glass blowing allowed glass makers to make entirely new shapes and designs, breaking free from the conventional forms and patterns used in the past. And inflated wares could be left plain or further embellished, such as with trail decoration or rolled and colored chips of glass. The options were only limited to the glass maker's imagination. Blown objects require less glass to make, a reality that turned glass vessels from a luxury object to an affordable item. The rising demand for glass vessels required the makers of raw glass to design furnaces with greater capacity for melting. Thus, the tank furnace was developed. And from this early period, glass was also recycled, as we've already heard, with broken glass shards reheated and reshaped into new wares. This blown cup was made by inflating hot glass into a decorated mold, and included in the design is the name of the maker, Enion. So up to now, I've spent a fair bit of time in the ancient world, and for good reason. The majority of techniques used to shape and decorate glass were developed before and during the Roman period, and they continue to be used today. But there were also new developments. This bowl represents the new technique of staining, Staining is achieved by applying a paste of silver or copper particles suspended in a binder to the surface of a room temperature glass. Once decorated, the piece is then fired at a low temperature in an oxygen poor or reducing environment. Once the glass is cooled, the paste is wiped off, leaving behind the metallic particles that have migrated into the body of the glass and colored it shades of brown, yellow, red, white, or green. <coughs> On this bowl is depicted a bird surrounded by fish and flowers. The entire surface appears to have been coated with a copper-rich, purple-red coating before the decoration was drawn. The surface has a pale brown cast under reflected light, but the almost colorless glass, the coating, and the colorful stain come to life under transmitted glass. So you're seeing both light effects in this slide. This ornate vase was decorated with brightly colored enamels, a technique that developed from the earlier Roman tradition of painting glass. Enamel is made from a powdered glass and is suspended in an oily material. It is then painted onto a cold glass object and fired at a low temperature. This allows the enamel to melt onto the surface without deforming the glass object. But unlike earlier painted decoration, enamel does not wear off the surface. Much of the late medieval and renaissance glass produced in central and northern Europe was made of a distinctive green glass called forest glass. The coloration was caused by the iron impurities present in the sand from which it was made. Such vessels were made in small glass houses located in forests, close to the source of fuel and of potash, the flux that lowered the temperature at which sand melts. During this period, authorities all over Europe became concerned about the consumption of wood, it was needed for constructing both buildings and ships. As a result, the quantities of glass that could be made was closely regulated so as not to consume too much timber. Eventually, these restrictions led to the use of coal for glass furnaces instead of wood. One of the most storied industries is that of Venice, centered on the island of Murano. The industry that began around 1268, and what Venetian glassmakers are best known for is the creation of Cristallo, an incredibly clear and long-working colorless glass that allowed them to create the most fragile and elegant of glasswares. Part of the recipe's secret was the use of quartz pebbles from the Ticino and Adige rivers, rather than sand, which contained impurities that would color the glass. And the plant ash that was used as a flux was imported initially from Syria and Egypt, and later from Sicily and Spain. 
The final key ingredient was manganese dioxide used as a decolorizer. It came to Venice from the Piemonte region. The secret of Cristallo was closely guarded, and Venetian glassmakers worked under strict regulations, including restricting their movements to protect the recipe and the industry. Venice dominated the glass world from about 1500 to about 1700, much to the chagrin of their competitors in other parts of Europe. The hallmarks of Cristallo can be seen in this goblet with a dragon stem, with its incredibly thin walls and crystal clear glass. The skill of Venetian glassmakers was legendary, and they perfected the process of making each segment of a vessel and then combining them while hot. But eventually, all good things must come to an end, and the secrets of colorless glass made their way from Venice to other parts of Europe. As a result, distinctive regional glassmaking styles emerged to compete with Venice and one another in the marketplace. This covered goblet has been decorated with diamond point engraving to create the lacy designs on the body. This light cutting technique first made its appearance in antiquity, thus this decoration represents another continuation of an ancient technique. Venice was also a center of glass bead production beginning around 1500, and the rediscovery of how to draw hollow canes transformed the industry. One of the highly decorative beads, the chevron, or rosette, was the most famous. Composed of multiple layers of glass, the ends of the beads are ground away to reveal the layers of color. This type and many others were exported to Africa, where they were considered by many cultures to be highly valuable. It is important to recognize that beads like this were traded for human lives as part of the African slave trade, but they also stimulated a domestic bead making tradition across the African continent that continues today. This basket was likely made to celebrate a wedding, as the couple in, is in the center of this composition suggests. The small beads used to decorate it are called seed beads and were manufactured primarily in Venice and Bohemia. Like chevron beads, seed beads were widely distributed as trade goods. As the continent of North America began to be explored by Europeans in the early 16th century, they brought quantities of seed beads with them to trade. Because a beading tradition already existed among the American Indian tribes, glass seed beads began to be incorporated into the production of items that were traditionally decorated with beads made from natural materials. Glass was first used for windows by the Romans, and the practice continued for hundreds of years. In the medieval period, we're all familiar with the development of stained glass windows for cathedrals and how they were used to carry the, convey the stories of the Bible to those present in the building. Stained glass was also used in domestic contexts, and this decorative window is a sundial meant to be placed in a declining or non-south facing window. We know this from the arrangement of the symbols of the hours of the day that are placed around the left, bottom, and right sides of the central panel. Throughout the history of glass making, there has been a strong relationship between those who make the recipes for glass and those who fashion that glass into decorative and functional objects. One example can be seen in England where George Ravenscroft worked to improve the clarity and brilliance of glass used for fine tableware. He experimented with the addition of lead oxide to the raw materials and by 1676, he succeeded in making crystal clear lead glass that did not deteriorate. And while his goal was to improve tableware, lead glass had additional applications. So now it's my turn to spend a few moments on science. Six major scientific instruments were invented during the 17th century. The telescope, microscope, barometer, thermometer, air or vacuum pump, and the pendulum clock. And all but the clock employed glass in a fundamental way. The designer of this tabletop telescope, Peter Dolland, is co-credited with the development of the achromatic lens in which colorless lead or flint glass and soda lime glass are combined to show refraction without net dispersion. Instruments like the telescope and the microscope enabled its users to go beyond the domain of the everyday into new unexplored realms. This simple microscope is composed of a small colorless lens set within a wide circular frame. 
The object being examined was affixed to the metal needle, and the rod holding it slid back and forth to bring the specimen into focus. And this was how science came into the home. A number of technical advances in glassmaking occurred during the 1700s, and those advances had a direct impact on how we live our lives today and experience the world around us. One of them was the making of large cast plate glass by pouring molten glass onto a large metal table with shallow sides and roll, rolling the glass out evenly using a huge copper rolling pin. The ground and smooth surface was perfect for windows and for mirrors. Imagine the impact on architecture and in daily living that resulted with the ability to bring more daylight into interior spaces with larger window panes. Additional interior illumination was provided by small tabletop lighting fixtures, often made of faceted lead glass, that were placed in front of mirrors to reflect the light back into the room. It was at this time that the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles was built, and shop fronts added large windows to display the wares sold within. <clears throat> in the English colonies of America, glassmaking was beginning to emerge as an imported industry. It was amongst the earliest European industries untaken, uh, undertaken in America, and we know of glassmaking from the archaeological excavations of Jamestown. Ultimately, these attempts were not successful, and for nearly a century, glassware was imported from Europe. Ultimately, these attempts were not, uh, excuse me. Eventually, glassmaking industries were established up and down the eastern <coughs> seaboard, including in Pennsylvania, where William Stiegel, a German immigrant, established a factory in 1763. The shapes and styles of early North American glass closely resembled European types, as this amethyst flask demonstrates. Progress in engineering and manufacturing in the 19th century led to even further developments in glassmaking. The introduction of the hand press in the 1820s, when combined with molds, resulted in the manufacture of glass multiples of the same size and decoration. A metal mold was placed in a press, molten glass was ladled into the mold, and the operator pulled a lever which drove a plunger into the glass, forcing it against the sides of the mold. With the introduction of pressing, a team of two operators could produce four times as many glasses as a team of three or four glass blowers, and affordable pressed items became commonplace. Despite the popularity of pressed glass, engraved and cut glass continued to be popular among those in higher society, and one of the central places for producing such glass in the latter 19th century was Corning, New York also known as the Crystal City. The Houghton family had relocated the Brooklyn Flint Glass Works from Brooklyn to Corning in 1868, and after being rechristened Corning Glass Works, began to focus their production on tableware and technical glasses. One of their products was thick-walled blanks that were then sold to companies that specialized in glass cutting. One of the leading companies in the United States at that time was J. Horan Company, also located in Corning. The pattern of this brilliantly cut bowl is called the Crystal City Pattern in honor of the manufacturing town. The stylistic opposite to cut glass was art glass, and one of the leading American manufacturers of art glass was Louis Comfort Tiffany. The dragonflies and water flowers lamp epitomizes his Art Nouveau style by combining a multicolored lampshade of dragonflies and flowers with a base design of a lily pad in glass and bronze. <laughs> Tiffany was renowned for the unusual formulations of glass that he created to create his unique and beautiful works. <clears throat> and now a little bit more about Harvey Littleton. Harvey Littleton was a child of Corning, the son of research physicist Dr. Jesse Littleton, who worked for Corning Glassworks. Jesse and Harvey's mother, Bessie, are associated with the near-mythical story about the development of Pyrex cookware. Bessie baked a sponge cake and a sawed-off Nonex battery jar, and the rest is history. Mm -hmm. Harvey pursued a career as a ceramic artist, but he also wanted to create artistic works in glass, and in 1962, he teamed up with Dominic Labino, a glass research scientist at Johns Manville near Toledo, Ohio, to hold a workshop to demonstrate that glass blowing could be achieved outside of a factory setting by building a small furnace for glass working. 
The next year, Littleton introduced the first university for pro program for glass in the United States at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and the American studio glass movement was born. This work, entitled Upward Undulation, is made from slumped sheet glass and successfully exemplifies Littleton's interest in capturing the dynamic, fluid quality of glass. The American studio glass movement is nearly synonymous with the name of Dale Chihuly. It is arguable that he has done the most to expand our appreciation of contemporary art glass today. His exuberant approach to color and form are aptly conveyed in this sculptural work, Fern Green Tower. I showed to you here in an earlier form. It was actually expanded in height at Dale's request in 2013 from 11 feet to 15 and a half feet because he felt it looked too short in his architectural setting at our museum. One of the founders of the Pilchuck Glass School, no, as a founder of the Pilchuck Glass School, and you heard from Chris about that this morning, Dale is regarded as an icon and a visionary in the glass world, and I really look forward to hearing his remarks tonight. Another icon in the contemporary glass world is the Venetian maestro Lino Tagliapietra. His works are a fluid demonstration of the technical mastery of Venetian technique and an enthusiastic approach to color and form. Lino was invited by Dale Chihuly and Benjamin Moore to come to teach at Pilchuck in 1979, and that became a trip that changed his life and the life of American glass art. After that first trip, he returned to the United States every year to teach and to work. And this work, Endeavor, is an assemblage of 18 sculptural forms suspended in the air by steel cables. The boat-shaped forms recall the many gondolas that navigate the waterways of Venice and the island of Murano. Lino's home. I close my remarks today with one of the most recent works to come in our, into our collection, and one that embodies once again the artistic interest in science and in using the material of glass to reveal the unseen. Entitled The Secret Life of Glass, this work by Spencer Finch is composed of 16 glass panels fused together to create a multicolored wave-like composition. The pattern was derived from a heat map made of the glass curtain wall in front of which this work is now installed. The heat map was created by tanking the temperature of the glass facade at various points on February 14, 2017. And when the temperature variations were plotted into this pattern, Finch determined which color to assign to which temperature. The result is the contemporary equivalent to a stained glass window, but without the traditional leading as the glass from which it was made is created by bullseye glass and is completely compatible in terms of its coefficient of expansion. This has allowed the different colors to be fused together into these panes. The Secret Life of Glass has become one of my favorite pieces in our collection, and as you can see from this image, encountering it in the late afternoon can be a soul-lifting experience, exactly what a beautiful work of art can be in our lives. I would like to close by saying thank you to the National Day of Glass program coordinators, and in particular to Kathleen and David for encouraging me to speak today. I also want to thank my fellow members of the North American Steering Committee for IYOG for their ongoing efforts to draw attention to this very special material. I also extend my thanks to the staff of the Corny Museum of Glass, who celebrate glass every day and who assisted me with the preparation of today's presentation. And lastly, I want to thank all of you who are attending this important conference. While I know a bit about the art and history of glass, there remains much that I do not know, and I so appreciate expanding my knowledge by listening to all of you. And I have to say I have a little bit of patent envy now, <laughs> but I will share with you that the Corning Museum of Glass does have a patent, and Mr. Steve Gibbs, who's sitting up here in the audience, owns that patent for the development of the all-electric hotshot that we use at our museum. Thank you very much.